Tommy Jang here with my good friend of the internet, Kent Schaefer. Thanks for being with us today, Kent. My pleasure. Thank you, Kenny. Um, it's great to connect over the interwebs and have discussions like this. Uh, we've been chatting in the pre-show interview stages here a little bit about different modes and mediums, I guess, of getting the word out. Um, in your past, you've been a successful blogger. I think many people have um, name and brand awareness of what you've done for the church and resourcing people in a very generous manner with content. Um, and you've kind of gone off the grid a little bit. And um, yeah. today um, we are looking at social media and video and all stuff. So let's get into that conversation. But before we do that, let's just spend like 60 seconds on who you are, what you're doing today. What's your passion? What's your focus right now? Sure. Um... My name is Kent Schaefer, and I used to, to blog about best practices and ministry at a site called churchrelevance.com and also helping uh, design websites, uh, web strategy, logos, communications, things, and then ended up transitioning into a season where for the last six years, working with an organization called Open Church on how can we if possible, if God wills, take all 45,000 denominations around the world and be able to create a digital ecosystem that allows them to be able to share resources, to be able to work together by having a knowledge for what each other's doing. And it's been a process of first listening to these groups wow. and then prayerfully working through prototypes and figuring out how do you have these bits and pieces to work together, which we actually launched our um, official phase one back on November uh, 2016. So that's pretty exciting after a long journey of five years, oh six my gosh. years. Oh my gosh. Talk about a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. Where did that come from? Where did yeah. that vision come from? Uh, it came from as talking through ideas with groups like YouVersion uh, and, and Life Church. They had their um, their open resource platform, which they still have. But when they, they originally launched it back in, I think, 2006, um, by one year later, in 2007, they, they were talking, what if we expanded this out to be a, a huge platform that other people could right. contribute resources to? Um, and that was something that they thought about, maybe releasing some software like they've done with their church online platform. I was also talking with groups like Saddleback Church around you know, what would it look like if pastors.com had more of a global representation of ideas and both life church and pastors.com do expand out beyond you know their their own bubble to, to have content but the journey that i ended up going down was one of seeing all right there's a lot of different flavors of christianity what does it look like to make it so that you know, a very small church could take part as well as a huge denomination, right, right. or this flavor over here can be uh, taking part as well as this one without there being some like huge fight over theology in the middle. And in that process, ended up feeling just a, a very distinct, clear call to to begin something called Open Church, which is the journey I've been on for the last several years. Wow, wow. So let's circle back to the blog. So you've been very successful in using that platform right. in the past of connecting church leaders and resourcing mm -hmm. the church. Um, right. And since then, I mean, as a veteran, right, because we, we talk mm -hmm. in dog years for social media technology right. today. Um, since then, things have changed quite a bit, right? Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, we're going in a, a, a direction mm -hmm. where, you know, we've heard the death of uh, blogging, the death of Twitter. Um, where do you think things are going? Facebook, you know, announced that, Within five years, all content, 90, over 95% of content will be video. Do you agree with that? And is, is that the way people are going right now? Um, you know, I won't be surprised if it at least goes down that road. It, I won't just say just video, but it's um, video paired with text. It's almost like you're taking your blog posts or your tweets um, and you're adding a video backdrop behind it. Um, those are, I think, the most powerful ones because of something like Facebook mobile, you're scrolling through your phone and then a video pops up, it's auto playing. You might not hear the audio, but th there are the words there. And that's an extremely engaging form of media. And what I... I and you're talking of beyond 
um, a closed caption utility function, right? You're talking, right. looking at that medium video and the ability to put text on it and reinventing it um, to, right. to, to deliver content. Yeah, at the crudest form, closed captioning certainly helps. But if you're looking at what's going to cut through the clutter of the future, I think that it's going to be a, a blend of artistry with good communication of how do you use not just text words, not just imagery, not just audio words, but you blend everything in together. So there's this storytelling component and there will kind of be pendulum swings that occur right now. A huge driver, obviously, with something like this are platforms like Facebook, are platforms like Instagram. I wouldn't necessarily say Snapchat because I think that's something that's a little bit more of a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, successful communication platform. But um, the way I see things is if you started blogging in like around 2001, 2002, it didn't really matter what you blogged about. You could ride that fame, at least in the church space. You could ride that fame to 2009. Like, you could, like if you were one of the original bloggers, you were just, it's kind of like, just blog, you'll do well. Around the time when I started, so 2005, 2006, 2007, if you had the best practices. So this is your writing good content, keeping it short, formatting it for the web, some catchy headlines, you're posting frequently enough, you're going to be successful. But then it was amazing because I started in 2006 and I remembered that in 2009, that's when we started to see some things shifting up. Um, so this was the era where um, and, and you ended up having Seth Godin talking about tribes. You yes. ended up having the blogosphere growing large enough that people were starting to not be as collaborative, but break off. Right. Because 2006, and I, I grew up as a missionary's kid, saw territorialism, all that stuff with the ministry. But around that 2006 era, we saw denominational walls break down. And I remember um, in spring of 2007, I believe, going and hanging out with uh, some of the guys over at Life Church. There was Terry Storch and Bobby Grunewald, the, the co-founders of View Version. Love those They're guys. They're laughing, saying, yeah, a like a, a couple of years ago, we wouldn't have even been talking to each other because Terry was at a Southern Baptist church. That is true. At Young Junior Fellowship Church, Dallas, Texas. And Bobby Grunewald's here in Oklahoma at an Evangelical Covenant Church. And the blogosphere, it broke down so many of these barriers that, that in is the so 90s so were... True. In the 90s, these were distinct denominational and distinct theological camps. And you see this weird blending that's happened. But while the blogosphere was smaller, we saw all of these, these people coming together. As it grew larger, particularly among contemporary evangelicals, contemporary evangelicals, I think, might struggle a bit more with um, selfish ambition than other camps of, of Christianity. And part of that's because they can be, uh, there's like this, this strong evangelistic bent. So uh, on the one hand, they're, they're very good at evangelism, but what could the, the downside be of that? You know, are we making sure we aren't being narcissistic? Are we making sure that we aren't being driven by selfish ambition? And so there could be this, this dynamic of like, oh, it's getting so big, we can't, we don't have the mental bandwidth to interact with anyone anymore. I'm going to create my own tribe. I'm going to create my own group. I'm going to create my own program or whatever. And we started to see this erosion around 2009, 2010, to where even there were some friends of mine who were working at really well-known organizations, which in the past would have been like a almost shoe-in for being a successful right, blogger. Right. Um, their content was phenomenal. Great frequency, great everything. And they weren't able to get their blogs Struggling. off the ground. Yep. And so it almost started to be this weird dynamic. And even in that season, you started to sh see the shift from where blogging was kind of originally more of like here, you know, keep it short. It was almost like just the facts, all that type of thing, which you see a parallel with advertising, 1950s, 1940s, 1960s advertising. It's very cognitive based. Now it's far more emotional and story based if it's going to be really effective. And we saw the shift over to not just mom bloggers, but also this shift that occurred where um, 
like female faith bloggers or um, guys that might be writing more out of story where right, right. we ended up seeing the shift of senior pastors who are blogging not really doing that anymore because a lot of theirs wasn't the storytelling wasn't the oh i'm i'm coming home from work and i'm dealing with this in my, my household and it's it's powerful because we end up seeing um I, I i had the opportunity to do a compassion bloggers trip in march 2010 to kenya and um i didn't do so well at <laughs> like recruiting people to be sponsors and um from what I understood, sites like Tim Challey's also didn't do as well. And both of us, and Tim far more than, than myself, had a decent readership within his sector. The people who did really well were those who did a lot of storytelling. People like Ann Voskamp mm. did amazing for raising compassion support. And compassion found that those bloggers trips are actually like dollar for dollar they might be the most effective. Either that's the most effective or having people like Sean Groves and musicians tour around and cast sing and yep. then also do. Th those are the two most effective channels, but I want to say that the blogger strips were most effective. And so we kind of see this dynamic of stories being valuable. Um, you know, of course, that gives way into like this next era of where you have storytelling, people kind of building up this this very passionate audience that's wanting to continue the narrative continue the journey with you but then you also have more link bait oriented yeah, content definitely from, you know upworthy was kind of like the the original innovator and buzzfeed and you know even seeing you know people like abraham piper who back in the the golden years of church blogging had done he had 22 words which was this really clever intelligent um blog on each post was usually 22 words <laughs> and he's figured out how to say something uh, wise and, and useful and all that and he's ended up 22 words now is uh it gets incredible traffic but he ended up shifting it to being um one of those sites that aggregates interesting stories funny videos all that from from around the web and it's it's fascinating what it takes to be more successful these days. And we see this kind of evaporation of what worked a couple of years ago, no longer working today. Is it is that one of the reasons why video, I think, is at least evolving to the point of having much more success than text-based storytelling right. in that um, video evokes uh, much more emotion and it feels like you're a journeyman with the actual storyteller? I think video has that that potential. It's like it, it, you think about if I were to hold up a piece of paper and it has a drawing on it, that drawing, what's done on a two-dimensional plane, has potential to invoke emotions in you. But if you're inserted into a four-dimensional world, so you have time, you have all five senses being engaged, maybe even beyond five senses, there might be a spiritual element there. That of actually being in an environment that's affecting you and there's smell that's sparking memories, there's sounds, there's the vibrations, that's going to have a far greater potential of doing something that lasts, that sticks with you. And so I think that's just adding that extra layer of dimension. So what do you think about, so right now, right, the cusp of video is 360 video. Um, and I right. think it's trying, it's almost, uh, it's almost, what do they say? It's, it's a, a hammer trying to find a nail, right? Like, right. Um, even in that medium, what do you think, where do you think that's going? Uh, What's well, a I, great I, use of 360 video? Because it isn't just, you know, daily yeah. use of video. What I end up seeing is anytime there's new technology, there's something that I like to call tech novelty, or in, in most cases, I should say, I don't want to make an absolute statement, but we see Photoshop and uh, in the 90s, very good designers. It's like, oh, yeah, drop shadow, bevel that. <laughs> make that, you know, make that a red button, you know, that type of stuff. And then we, even, you know, 98, 2002, it was still all about the layers, all about the grunge design. And it took time, even among accomplished designers, they were a little bit drunk on the novelty of what the technology could do. Sure. And they become blinded to the finesse of actually using the principles and the science of good design that they already knew. 
a rediscovery of white space, a rediscovery of something that's subtle. So often, I mean, even with a great athlete, um, sometimes they make it look so easy. Wow, look at how they run. Look at how that guy does that impossible yoga move. That's, I can, that looks so easy. I should be able to do that. And it's like, no way, you can't do that. They make it look so effortless, effortless and that's what good design does. And we see the same thing even like with, with worship environments where in the medieval church, particularly among when the, the Catholic church was figuring out, you know, there's some competition and marketplace shifts with Protestantism. So all the more so it helps to have an environment that's appealing, that's attractive, that can even prime people to think of the divine. Sure. We have known for a long time that worship environments can have tremendous value. But then when we end up shifting into the world of technology that we've had um, in the previous, let's say, 12 years, there's this dynamic of, again, trying to do everything at once, where it's not to say that any one piece or ingredient of what's on stage is bad. Any of those elements could be used well. And by elements, I mean things like fog machines, yes. strobe lights, <laughs> gyros, motion lyrics, um, calligraphy lyrics, motion video behind the lyrics, guitar yeah. solos, you know, all sorts Artists of Artists on that's, stage, that's going on. flag ministries. Right. And when you have all of it going on at once, you have nothing going on at all, pretty much. It's just this overwhelming bubble to where if the point of worship is to turn the trajectory of people's hearts to Christ, to turn people's attention to, to God and tune out everything else, people like sometimes people have better worship experiences if they close their eyes. Because there's so much junk and clutter going sure, on on sure. the stage, but and it's because it's it's hard to tell good stories. But going from text to mm -hmm. image, image to video, mm -hmm. right. is feeding some innate desire, right? There's this drive towards presence and relationship, and right. something you're trying to get re removing some sort of friction that technology introduces or distance introduces right and mm -hmm. so what i'm what i've been pondering recently is where where's what is that drive so that you can discern um the wheat from the chaff on 360 video right so you can discern then what right. is a real powerful use of 360 video because it is a novelty right now right, right? uh powerful usage in my mind are cases that it's not technology for technology's sake. It's not 360 for 360. It's actually having real applications. So same thing like with a um, worship environment. So usually any of that stuff's done poorly because maybe people don't necessarily, they, they want to use it, but it's not always applicable. Maybe it's not the right tool for that right, right moment. Exactly. Or maybe they aren't gifted storytellers and using that technology, uh, which isn't, not a bad thing you have to start somewhere um and so much of the most powerful like it's that's a whole nother theological rabbit trail I cut <laughs> yes. out. as far as like god does not need all of these things that we do in our own strength but i remember one of the best uses of a, a video behind lyrics that i've seen was uh one church was uh, for easter singing um the song that goes hallelujah grace like rain falls down and right in that moment they had a video of drops just falling down and hitting and in in that sense it's being used very powerfully because you're having people focus on wait what am i saying because so often we can sit in the pews right. stand in the pews right. and say stuff robotically without engaging with our hearts and minds and so 360 video in a sense that can make people feel like they're present like they're actually there so maybe it's oh here's this people group are trying to serve here's what life is like for them and to be able to have and not just like 360 almost is like this first layer of the virtual reality world um once you get to virtual reality world and there's been a couple hackathons i've been a part of um where there's some some groups a venture christian church out of um silicon valley area partnered with uh, developers from World Vision yep. to work on some, some Google VR goggles on what it looks like for Venture Christian Church to kind of say, hey, here's some footage from like one of our missions trips. And I think they had it like where they had posters in their lobby that you scan a QR code and then it opens up like they can see this 
this environment that has the audio and everything and some statistics, that starts to take the right steps in the right direction. And what's so interesting is in terms of using communication or media well, what we put in is so much of a, a dictator as, as the outputs. Uh, I, I love one of my go-to examples, and this isn't necessarily saying that the, the output got better, but just how society and prevalency change how people behave. But there used to be a show on in the early 90s called um, American Gladiators. Oh, yeah, it's still <laughs> so, on. Yeah, it's still on. So I know that they, they had done a, a reboot type thing, but um, in like the, the early 90s, they had done like they'd interview people like, oh, man, what did you think when you're climbing that rock wall and Blaze was coming to get you and he slipped and you made it to the top and early 90s people weren't used to having a lot of video cameras seeing themselves on it was before the era of high school musical and generation z being inundated with kind of slick presentation of oneself and so they're like oh man like i thought i was going to lose and like i i don't know there is just it's almost this beautiful bumbling over an interview. It was this dynamic of it seemed more real and true versus they had done a reboot of American Gladiators just 10 years later around 2002. And they would interview like, man, what did you think when, when you're going up the rock wall and Blaze slipped and he didn't catch you? They're like, oh, man, I knew Blaze was a good dude. He can't catch the heat. I'm on fire. And it, there's something that happened in a decade. Right that changed the way people behave. And there's this weird dynamic on the one hand where everyone's becoming, almost everyone's becoming a better photographer, not just because of the technology, but also because we have things like Instagram and Pinterest, our buffets of inputs can turn people who were, had no hope of being a great artist before to they have better inputs than people who went through, they have a, a master of fine arts sometimes. It's astounding. So you have this stream of where people, the everyday person is becoming far better artists and just knowing how to communicate because they've seen it it's part of the everyday diet but then there's this paradox that comes with that where we almost preferred the humanity that's real from those 1992 interviews then uh, i've heard people describe it as being too slick and that's that's the type of thing where i've even said to a church before like um yeah, your your announcements, the, the pastor that's getting on between things, he's too slick. It would almost do better if you intentionally added in like a mistake here or there. Right, exactly. Because he'd more human. Of course, then if you're doing that, it's going to mess up anyway. So it's rather what you want to do is it's, I mean, you practice beforehand. You practice having, um, you know, composure. Obviously, there's some value of being good at teaching. We see that in qualifications of elders and overseers. So now what that means from a biblical historical view, as far as being a good teacher, doesn't necessarily mean be a Ted talk, you know, top 10 performance, but we know that there is a quality value, but um, not getting so hung up on the performance that you lose the humanity. Cause usually people would rather see bumbling, but it be wrong from the heart and something that's yeah. too slick and, we aren't always able to articulate the differences as to, oh, wait, it was that micro expression on that person's face where I, because they didn't have enough wrinkles around their eyes, I knew it was insincere. Definitely. Today, it's the vulnerability is right. showing that authenticity where you're not on for social, right? Right. And so that's one of those challenges, I think, with, with being um, a pastor, particularly in the Western church. There's, there's a lot of pressure in the wake of all the good things that have happened from the church growth movement, all the good things that have happened from more attractional models. There's also a lot of baggage and unrealistic expectations um, as to what a pastor's role should be. And they get so hung up when uh, we, we end up seeing more trends with millennials as far as looking for authenticity. And um, the thing about authenticity is it's best to be yourself. <laughs> Rather, you can't fake it. And people can tell if you're faking it. Right. And that's, I think this is my, the last point that we can discuss yeah. today is one of the things that um, in a group of pastors that we were discussing that what the millennials or the younger generation mm-hmm. um, is craving that authenticity and right. 
the journey together side by side from their pastors, from their leaders, from the people they right. looked up to in terms of their faith journey um, is, um, uh, how do you put it, is, is part of the challenge today. If you really want to be a leader communicating where you typically would go for blogging or vlogging, etc., is the job not to become um, a, a publisher where you're putting out polished pieces one after the other, and instead, it, it literally is the daily vlog where you wake up every day and, you know, in, you know, off the cuff, you're sharing your devotional time, thoughts, reflections, etc. Or off the cuff, you are reacting to the response that the congregation had to your sermonizing. Um, is that the authenticity that is going to cut through the clutter? It's kind of a yes and no. I mean, again, things are in life are so complicated uh, because... Uh, I used to talk about design as credibility. And so if someone doesn't have a relationship, if they haven't engaged with your content yet, your aesthetic presentation, at least based on culturally, that's going to be valuable. So like I've lived in gated communities and golf courses. I've lived in um, homeless districts and rough areas of town. And if I'm in the affluent suburbs and you have cracked pavement and grass growing up through it, there's going to be a different set of expectations. Sure, of um, if you take a church that's in the middle of a um, rougher neighborhood and it's too polished, you take that suburban parking lot and you put it in there, you might actually drive people away somewhat because it seems too slick. Um, and that's that's not to, to make a black and white statement, but there, there's certain things as far as, you know, trying to prime like okay like are you fitting in with with the culture and so what becomes challenging and even as um some people have tried to analyze casey neistat's uh videos um he is a professional videographer that makes his authenticity look just on the fly but he puts hours and hours of work into making it look that good and part of the challenge, and what's always a struggle for me, is looking at the dynamics of so often God just the powerful moves of God happen outside of man's strength. But then there is this dynamic of um, sometimes uh, the things that we do can reach further. So, parable of the talents, I look at as a spiritual gift of administration among the two people who were being obedient. One of them was able to reach further, maybe because of the spiritual gift of leadership or spiritual gift of administration. So there is a value for practicality in ministry, but it always has to be within the parameters of God. And so there are dynamics that we see very practical choices as helping ministries go further. And talking in terms of communication, having some base level expectations for what the the people need and want i think is important right exactly. and often even looking at marshall McLuhan type ideology of medium is the message I and mean, it's your your cell phone you're never supposed to be a slave to the technology of your phone rather it's supposed to be an extension of your communication it's supposed to help you and so if you think about how would i communicate with someone one-on-one -on -one? like if, if my only job for the rest of my life was to disciple one person as alan hirsch says you know discipleship being turning the trajectory of one's heart towards yes. Christ, whether they're a believer or not. So, so whether it's evangelism or whether it's discipleship, it's, you know, it's all discipleship. And what would it look like to do that for one person or for three people? If all I had to do was disciple three people or 50 or 100 or 10,000. And as you scale larger, we tend to have to have systems or routines that degrade the quality of that engagement. And so as we try to think through, you know, what does this look like? One of the things I find fascinating is in sales, it's always said that it's better to dress equal or above Correct. your mark. Yeah, I've heard that Whoever too. Whoever you're trying to reach, yeah. you dress equal to them or a little bit above. But what I've found in personal experience, I believe that this is very, very important if you're trying to optimize spiritual potential, is you dress equal to or slightly below who you're trying to reach. Because in that case, it sets the stage for people to um, be able to engage with what you're saying, with 
hopefully gospel, scripture, things that release the Holy Spirit. And if it's too much flashiness, if you're you're elevating up too much, it's easy for people to focus on, oh, wow, look at, oh, man, yes. that looks amazing. And that can happen with our videos as well. Who are you trying to reach? And what's the expectation for production quality? Now, there's ex- there's when it comes to video communications, there's a ton of exceptions to the rule. So you can have, I think it was uh, like Joseph Gordon-Levitt and uh, Zoe Deschanel ended up doing a um, like duet online together and it was just with horrible lighting like home video camera and like a an apartment or something didn't look fancy didn't look like hollywood um their celebrity it's allows them to be able to do that and still get a tremendous amount of viewership and their celebrity um because of the lower level quality it can actually seem endearing yeah it can enhance it right right yeah. it's um it's like wow here's a it because it's not always about being slick. It's about what does the medium communicate? And well, so that, is it the medium yeah. or is it just the, whether you have strategic nature, is it premeditated content or is it something that you're allowing the viewers to see me as I am, right? So um, do I have a runway before you record and hit that uh, record button? Or is it you're catching me and this is literally who I am if you're going to live with me? Um, I'd say in, in this case, like for, for the example that I gave, uh, you know, those celebrities doing a duet, um, the medium, meaning the stylistic elements yeah. of the medium. So like any film, the color grading that's on it, what's, what's the music, what's the color grade, what's all of these things set an emotional tone that interpret how people process the information right, exactly. that's said and that's, that's um, viewed. And so what it does in a case where you have two very well-known celebrities is having lower quality um, footage shows an intimacy. It's like, oh, I'm inviting you into, it's like, just, hey, this feels authentic. It's not a Kardashian staged environment of (laughs) our assistant took this, ran it through Photoshop three times, pushed it out. It's, it's, It's... It's different in that sense. And that's where I think what we have to realize is what's the best way to connect. Um, I mean, even I I find it fascinating that when LinkedIn's tried to push some of their their video um, content, they've had their CEO use really shoddy footage, like from his camera phone. I think because there's almost wanting people to feel like, hey, like I can do that too. Yeah, I'm one of you guys, right? right? That's what that's what he wants to communicate. And so like with everything that we do, like all the stylistic elements, there's often something gained and something lost in, in how we, we communicate. And usually people get so hung up on trying to think through like, oh, like what, what do I have to do? Like I've so many different like conference events, whereas that one that had like this, uh, a pastor from some town in Massachusetts, that's like one of the oldest towns in the whole United States. And it was, uh, one of the Biola digital conferences from, from years ago. And he's like, yeah, um, my town hasn't changed in 200 years, really. And uh, should I be using Twitter? <laughs> and it's like, no, you, you shouldn't be using Twitter. Or there's another group that um, I remember a leader from the LA Latina community. Um, she came and she's like, this was in 2009. I feel like um, everyone at this conference is saying, Twitter, 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 and Twitter was definitely in its heyday then, but it just doesn't feel right. And to say, well, what what would be the normal way people would communicate with each other? It's like, oh, just face to face, or you know, call each other up and be like, hey, we have this event going on. And it's like, well, you could make a, a phone list and have ten volunteers call right. each other up and say, like, Traditional oh, hey, phone hey. Tree. yeah, yep. did you hear this? Is it's it's not the computer side, but it's just kind of, it's maintaining for this community. This is what works best. And like, there's been so many cases of like, even <laughs> people like there's what we used in the eighties for like children's ministry check-in. And we have new, really cool ways of checking in kids with um, like security check-in systems, scan barcodes, enter in all this stuff. And uh, he'll talk to congregations and we'll be like, yeah, it's like the old way worked better. <laughs> like this, this isn't working. And that's not saying every case. It's, but there will be some of these cases where there's exceptions to the rule of sometimes we get so focused on that we think using the latest technology, that's going to save things. 
when it's just being simple of like, okay, what resources do I have at hand? And what's the most effective way to make stuff work? Yeah, I, 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 you know, that's a, a good reminder for us to always look at what the core objectives are. And at the f- very foundation, most of the time, it's what's best for the relationship, right. not just for the fa- you know, use, use of technology. Yeah, I think so often as uh, church communicators, where some of the breakdown happens is there's this approach of we feel like we have to use the latest technology because we end up hearing that, exactly. like, oh, wait a second, there was this, um, this church didn't do well because they never adapted with the latest technology. But then what ended up happening is there's a difference on if you're pursuing technology and your audience isn't using that technology. But the case of like what ends up happening with these churches is their audience moved on and the church communicators never moved with them. Yeah, exactly. And just finding that that discernment between the two, I think is key. Well, it's a good reminder. Um, I thank you so much for checking in with us today. These are all great uh, things that we need to wrestle with. And, and I think one of the Thanks. takeaways I have from this conversation is that we really need to wrestle with the tensions that are present in so many of the different things that we decide to pursue for the sake of the kingdom, um, for right. our programs, for activities, and even just for our faith journey itself. And uh, I really appreciate your insights that you've uh, offered today. So um, mm-hmm. would love to sit down with you again sometime in the future, but really appreciate the insights that you shared today, Kent. That's been fun. Thank you, Kenny.